Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. If this is your, uh, not your first in the webinar series, but welcome. If this is uh, your first in the webinar series, thank you very much for joining us for this lunchtime. And I hope you, you enjoy um, this talk and, and I encourage you to continue participating in, these, in this webinar series brought to you through Trinity, um, uh, various schools, um, but various academics in working in climate action sustainability. Um, today's speaker, I'll introduce him in a moment, uh, uh, Professor Quentin Crowley, has just encouraged you all in the next minute or two to open the chat and perhaps give us an insight into your areas of interest, uh, just so he knows a bit about the background. So any of you, uh, if you have a moment now, uh, just open the chat, put a little bit of info in of, of wh where you're coming from in terms of background or organisation, and I'll give him a helpful feel of, of his audience. Um, that he's going to speak to in a few minutes. Um, so as always, um, thank you very much uh, for joining. This is our opportunity as Trinity academics to perhaps share knowledge and perspectives on how our work addresses national and global challenges. Um, with that, I suppose it's a great time for us to, to provide uh, an insight into what we do in terms of our research. Uh, in terms of our teaching, and Quentin will share probably some details of the pro type of programs that he's involved in. And it, it just helps you get an insight into what we're doing and helps you connect with us. So please um, interact with us. Uh, please share in the chat what you're, what you're where you're coming from. And I encourage you to, to add questions um, uh, later in the session as, as we go through. You can add them again to the Q&A and we'll come back to you later on if you want to talk to uh, Quentin directly or I'll liaise the questions to him. We're in part three. So if you're new to the series, we're, we've, you've missed eight. Um, but the great thing is these are all recorded. They're all available. And the both Quentin's and for, forthcoming uh, webinars are available to watch back um, via the Trinity YouTube channel. So once you find the link to any of these sessions, uh, you'll you'll find the path back to all of them. Um, uh, what I really uh, appreciate of our speakers is they they are also providing these two slides, uh, which is the priorities to the climate action plan for this year, and also the sustainable development goals. I won't dwell upon them, but really um, our work has national and international implications, and it's great to to realise and align our our thoughts and our presentations with what we do. So uh, Quentin will give an, a brief insight into into that that space of where he positions. So really, um, uh, I should hand over to to the person that is going to to inspire um, this afternoon, um, Quentin, uh, Professor Quentin Crowley. Um, your talk is is about systems innovation, sustainability, and climate action. It couldn't be more relevant in the role of climate action um, and you you run a number of programs around that and please do share those details. Um, Quentin is the director of the Center for the Environment and is associate professor within um, uh, geology and School of Natural Sciences to get that correct and uh, Quentin I suppose it's over to you to give a proper insight into to, 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 to where you're coming from in this space because your, your work in systems innovation is so important. Great. Thank you so much, John. No pressure then, eh? No pressure. So, uh, yes, let me just try and share my screen and start. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us on your lunch break, or if you're watching this as a recording, thanks for the recording. Um, as John mentioned, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a really great pleasure and honor to speak in the seminar series. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about systems innovation. Maybe some of you have heard of this before, maybe not. Um, and in particular, how this may be applied to global efforts, local efforts, university efforts in sustainability and, and climate action. So John, as he mentioned, um, provided some uh, slides and asked me to indicate how um, aspects of my research and what I'm presenting to you this afternoon uh, relates to climate action uh, in Ireland and particularly the latest climate action uh, policy. So a bit, um, I've been a bit ambitious with this. So I have um, highlighted areas in color where I touch on during this talk. And it's not to say that every single aspect of my research or every project deals with all of these, 
Um, but um, in terms of a portfolio of research and related activities, certainly it touches on, on many of these. So I've highlighted energy in terms of renewables, a built environment, um, farming, sustainability and farming practices, green business and enterprise, and also changing land use. Um, so there are many things here. It's a lot to cover uh, within a short talk, but hopefully I'll give you a bit of a flavor of some of my research um, and some related activities in teaching. Right, um, John also provided this template regarding SDGs. Similarly, I've been quite ambitious, I think, in terms of highlighting areas of relevance in the sustainable development goals and focus. So similar to the climate action plan, um, not every single one of my research projects deals with as many SDGs as is highlighted here, but I will touch on several of these. Um, you might like to keep an eye out during, um, uh, during the presentation on some of my slides where I will show some of these icons for the SDGs um, in the top right corner. So just to remind you of that. And in particular, I'm highlighting um, number 17 here, which is partnership for the goals, because Really what I'm going to uh, talk about this afternoon is something which is very multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary and requires partnership between very different disciplines sometimes to accomplish these um, SDGs. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, the picture on the right, for those of you who don't know it, it's the beautiful museum building on Trinity College campus. Um, I'm based in this building um, along with uh, part of engineering and geography. My home discipline is geology, which is within the School of Natural Sciences, uh, which is in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In broad terms, I describe my area of research as environmental geoscience. So my background is geology. Um, and as you'll see, some of my research relates to what I call deep time. And some of it relates to um, geoscience or environmental geoscience processes operating within the contemporary environment. And I'm going to touch on um, both of these. In terms of describing my research theme um, and really how I'm phrasing this particular seminar is dealing with earth system change. And in a broad sense, um, we are part of an earth system. And one thing which is certain is that earth systems are always changing. This change, it may be completely natural, or it may be something, something which is anthropogenic as a driver, or it may be a combination um, of these. So I, I will talk a bit about this uh, as well. So focus areas, as I've just mentioned, some of our research is applied to deep time, so over geological timescales, and some of it deals with contemporary environment and viewing us as a species, as part of global environmental or planetary systems, some of my research also deals with societal challenges within this contemporary environment. So that's a little bit of background on me. Um, if you are not familiar with Earth system science, um, I thought I would start with this really. In very broad terms, you could describe Earth system science as a science of studying interactions between all the different spheres on the planet. And by spheres, I mean geosphere, like the rock uh, record, the atmosphere, the gaseous part, hydrosphere, which is the watery part, and the biosphere, which are the living things, including us. So Earth system science looks at the complex interactions and dynamics within these different spheres and also between these different spheres. And this can be something which is on a planetary scale. It could be you know, planet Earth, or it could be something which is very local and very specific. Now, um, with my geologist hat on, um, geologists are highly trained in dealing with time scales, um, and also highly trained in dealing with spatial variations. So in a way, you can think of this as a kind of a four-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. It's three dimensions with time, so time being the fourth dimension, and they can occur over a range of different spatial scales. Now, for me, this is something which makes Earth system science as a topic very, very challenging, but I also feel very drawn to this and that I find that very interesting. So one of the interesting things is that these, these interactions um, in Earth system science, predominantly they're very complex and, and sometimes they act in very unexpected or unanticipated ways. 
And as I mentioned, this is something which is both very challenging, um, but I think very interesting. And lastly, but not leastly, I view us um, humans as parts of this dynamic Earth system. And we know that on a planetary scale, um, things which are anthropogenically um, derived, such as greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, is because of our activity. Now, um, you could argue that, you know, is this natural? Is it not natural? We're part of the Earth system. Are we not natural? Um, however, in terms of anthropogenic or Anthropocene, this is something in terms of rates of change to gaseous composition of the atmosphere and um, disruption of planetary climate systems. It's something which we think is really unprecedented. So in that regard, it's, it's non-natural. So let me um, take you on a bit of time travel. We're going to go back in time, and I'm going to explain how Earth system science um, in so-called deep time really got me started on this journey of thinking in Earth systems. The photograph on the right-hand side is my hand holding a rock sample. Uh, it's not just any ordinary rock sample. This is a sample of something which represents a paleosol or fossil soil and weathering horizon from an area in India. Now, why is this special? Um, it's special for a number of reasons. Um, it's very special because it formed an early Earth history. So I researched this um, and discovered that it formed around 3.02 billion years ago. So for those of you who don't have a geological mindset and aren't familiar with geological timescales, this is over 3,000 million years ago. It's very difficult for us to get our heads around these kind of timescales. So this is very early Earth. If you think about um, modern day soils, um, maybe you've got a window and you can look outside or just picture in your mind um, how soils form, in particular mineral soils. They form by breakdown of um, minerals and rocks, and they do this in uh, connection with the atmosphere. So there are some kinds of chemical reactions which occur within soils and weathering horizons, which are somehow influenced or mediated or controlled in some way by the gaseous composition um, of the earth at that time. Now, one remarkable thing that we found from studying this paleosol, not just its age at 3.02 billion years ago, but actually it contained chemical signatures for the presence of molecular oxygen. And this is a pretty big deal because the conventional wisdom at the time was that there was little or no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere till around 2.4 billion years ago. So this is over 600 million years earlier than previously thought um, that photosynthesis had evolved uh, as a biological mechanism to produce oxygen, free oxygen in the atmosphere. So this kind of research dealing in deep time really got me thinking about Earth system science, interactions between the solid Earth, and for instance, in this case, um, the gaseous Earth or the atmosphere. Um, and this is a very complex thing to try and envisage, particularly when going back so far um, in deep time over geological timescales. So let me fast forward um, to the present day, to the contemporary environment, and also take you from India to Ireland. This is also some of my research, which deals with uh, radon and radon in Ireland. Now, some of you may have heard of radon before. This is a radioactive gas. Um, it emanates from rocks, from soil, from water, and it is associated with lung cancer, or at least exposure to radon particularly indoors, um, is associated with an increased probability or likelihood of developing lung cancer later in life. Now, Ireland has a, um, an indoor, an average indoor radon concentration, which is population uh, weighted, of 98 becquerels per cubic meter. Now, maybe this figure means nothing to you. Let me explain. A becquerel um, is one radioactive disintegration per second. So picture a cube, one meter by one meter by one meter of air. And uh, so if we have one radioactive disintegration every second in that cube of air, that's one becquerel per cubic meter. So the, the population weighted average indoor radon concentration in Ireland is 98. So every second we have 98 radioactive disintegrations in that cube of air. And again, that might not mean very much to you, 
um, unless you consider that global average is around 40 becquerels per cubic meter and the UK average is around about 20 becquerels per cubic meter. So Ireland does have a challenge um, with uh, radon concentrations and in particular the estimated lung cancer cases which are related uh, to this. So it's estimated that around 350 or so lung cancer cases occur every year in Ireland because of people breathing air in their home. Um, aside from the devastating uh, loss of life um, or adverse, adverse health effects, um, there is an associated economic cost with this, which is in excess of 400 million euro per year. And this estimate includes the health care costs and loss of earnings. Now, um, I could speak a lot about this, about radon. It is a big research area for me. And I mention it in the context of this talk in terms of applying earth system science to the contemporary environment and to a contemporary societal challenge. So um, I'll explain a little bit um, in terms of how this works from an earth system science perspective. Um, so we are surrounded by um, the solid earth. Underneath our feet, we have different types of bedrock geology. We have different types of sands and gravels, which are known as quaternary geology. We have soils and the soils have particular characteristics such as permeability, I'm talking about gaseous permeability in this case, and we have different types of groundwater or aquifer type. So I put together many different types of digital data sets, um, and I model the probability of exceeding certain threshold level of indoor radon for all of the different permutations and combinations. So it's a kind of a spatial modeling. Um, and this resulted in a new radon map for Ireland, which was subsequently adopted by our Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, in May of last year. So if you now go online, you can put in your um, air code or your address, and you get an estimated probability of exceeding a certain threshold level, which in Ireland is set at uh, 200 becquerels per cubic meter. So the idea is that if you live in an area where this estimated indoor radon concentration is above this threshold level, you should really test in your home. Um, and if you go to the EPA website, you get guidance on how you can do that. And if you get a high reading from the radon testing, then the recommendation is to lower this. Um, there's no such thing as a lower safe limit for radon exposure. Um, but this is, I think, a nice example how one can apply an earth system science perspective and look at interactions between rocks, soils, bedrock, quaternary geology, water, and also the indoor environment, the built environment, because this is where the radon is accumulating. So from an SDG perspective, this research relates to um, good health and also sustainable um, cities and sustainable communities. So there are two aspects of my research, um, one dealing in a deep time, one dealing with a contemporary environment, and both really intrinsically linked with geoscience. Now, there's another aspect of geoscience I think is really pertinent here, and it's not necessarily the subject-specific knowledge, but more to do with ways of thinking and ways of working, which are intrinsically linked to geoscience. And one of these is the whole systems thinking. So let me explain. Uh, maybe you've heard of systems thinking before, maybe not. Um, I've posed the question here on the slide, how can geoscience contribute to global efforts in sustainability and climate action? And I would say um, that having this kind of mindset um, and using the methodologies of earth system science allows um, us to visualize and map very complex systems. I've given you two examples, one in deep time, one in contemporary environment, to illustrate this. Um, it also gives us ways to understand the interrelationships within and between systems. So for instance, between the geosphere and the atmosphere, or between the geosphere and the built environment. Um, inherent understanding of systems dynamics. So systems go through change. Um, and having a way of dealing with time and processes and how these change with time is very useful when trying to visualize or model how complex systems evolve with time. Um, and part of this is modeling. So we can build um, 
models. The example I gave you of radon was built on a particular kind of modeling, which was initially developed for epidemiology, looking at the spatial and temporal occurrence of disease. And this is something which we adapted and used to model radon, and it, it turns out it, it works really well. So intrinsically linked with these kind of spatial and temporal modeling um, with geoscience, it's very useful to um, iterate, develop and iterate these models to better understand behaviors and dynamics of evolving systems. So I hope that's clear. Um, the simple diagrams on the right, um, one represents traditional thinking. This is shown here as a kind of a linear process. So there's a problem, you derive a solution. Um, or it could be, you know, two end members along a traditional thinking or linear thinking route, whereas systems thinking is more complex because it acknowledges that there may be maybe many components within a system, sometimes called elements, and that there may be various kinds of interactions or interdependencies between different elements within a system. These can be uh, positive or they can be negative. So, for instance, if we burn um, more fossil fuels, this results in increased greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. But if we say plant more trees, then this results in a decrease in CO2 in the atmosphere. So just because one thing increases doesn't mean that something else in the system also increases. Now, that may sound very theoretical. And um, so I'm going to give some practical examples. And I thought I would start um, close to home in relation to something historical rather than geological. Um, and this is the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution was really um, important for humanity um, in so many ways. So many industrial innovations occurred at the time. This resulted in increased productivity and um, growth of large industrial centers and cities. And one could argue general improved quality of life for many, although admittedly not for all. But then on the um, negative or possible negative side, the Industrial Revolution was really fueled by burning of fossil fuels, so initially coal, which resulted in an increased anthropogenic um, emissions to the atmosphere. It also resulted in development of extractive industries. So not just thinking about coal, but the photo on the right um, shows the tailings and remains of the Avoca mine in County Wicklow. And um, so we're also dealing with lots of legacy issues from, you know, early stages of the Industrial Revolution, and these things still continue today. From, I suppose, a more theoretical standpoint, you could argue that uh, the advent of a linear economy really came with the Industrial Revolution, that it was very extractive um, and not really thinking about these complex dynamics, which, of course, were not known at the time. So um, one of the case studies I thought I would give an example of um, is in Almeria in Spain. One of the reasons why I'm going to use this as a case study, well, number one, because I think it's very interesting, but number two, I've just returned um, from a, an undergraduate geoscience field trip to Spain. So these are some of our students pictured here. And uh, we have 40 uh, fourth year undergraduate students in geoscience who will be graduating um, soon. And this was a culmination of their uh, fourth year course, and I think their last talk module before they start their exams. Now, in the context of um, earth system science and systems thinking, uh, the region in Spain is interesting in that there are many different um, contemporary and societal challenges. There are transitions in land use. There are um, an abundance of or proliferation of agri-food systems. Um, there is a lot happening in terms of energy, in terms of water use, the sustainability of communities, changes in biodiversity, and, and of course, climate change, which is both something very local, but is also part of a global climate change. So I thought this would be interesting to go through a few slides to um, give an example of systems thinking in relation to this area uh, in Saudi Spain. Maybe you've been to the area, maybe not. Um, the image on the right is a Google image, so a satellite image showing um, an area, the scale bar at the bottom right is two kilometers. And all of these white things, this white area, these are plastic polytunnels, which are used in agriculture. 
So the area, um, a lot of the area is is designated as a natural park, not a national park, but a natural park. And there's a bit of a loophole um, in the legislation whereby farms are allowed to expand farm holdings um, even within natural parks, um, but it is not permitted to build new farms. If you look at um, old photos from late 1970s or early 80s, you, you won't see any of these polytunnels here. So there's been a huge proliferation of this kind of agriculture in the region, which is very understandable uh, given the amount of sunlight um, and the temperatures they get, particularly um, earlier in the year when a lot of Europe is, is colder and can't support this kind of agriculture. There's a lot of large scale olive uh, farming ongoing in the area. Um, some of the farming is definitely very traditional. Um, but it's the scale of the olive farming that is really unprecedented and has, has expanded rapidly in the last few years. Now, both of these things are very good in terms of increased productivity. You could view this as analogous to the Industrial Revolution in a way. Um, they're good in terms of a global food supply. On the other hand, locally, um, such changes in land use are really devastating in terms of biodiversity loss, depletion of aquifers, which is the groundwater, contamination of land in some cases, and also increased desert, desertification. So it's of interest that within this region is Europe's only desert. It's the Tavernas Desert. And even the most conservative of climate models show an increase um, in the spatial uh, dimensions and size and position of, of this desert through time. So the area is becoming increasingly arid. Um, climate change has really hit this place very hard, and um, yet there's this huge proliferation of agriculture, which not only uses very large land surface, but uses very precious res resources in terms of uh, groundwater and other resources. So pictured here um, on the right, so some of our geoscience students uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this is a village which till quite recently was all but deserted. Uh, the village is called Gotchar. It uh, it's occurs quite above sea level. It's a very small village that had previously relied on well water. And what happened? The aquifers became very depleted uh, due to over extraction of the aquifers. Also the climate changed, uh, which meant there was less rainfall. So the area receives just over 300 millimeters per year on average. Uh, as I mentioned, it's part of or on the edge of a desert, the Tavernas Desert. Um, and depletion of this Alto Aguas aquifer had really catastrophic effects in terms of local groundwater supply. So one of the springs, the Los Molinos spring nearby, went from producing 40 liters per second uh, between 1970 and 2020 to around seven liters per second measured in 2020. So really devastating effects. Um, for some villages like Gotchar village here, which had relied on groundwater for their water supplies, the wells ran dry and it wasn't practical to live there anymore. They've now subsequently been connected to mains water supplies and the area is becoming repopulated, but it just shows how there can be this knock-on effect of something such as developing agriculture um, and the unintended consequence of um, deserted villages and um, depletion of the, of the aquifers. So it's one of the reasons why I think systems thinking is really important um, when thinking about uh, changes in the environment and in particularly changing uses such as changing land use. Something which uh, we noticed this year, which I hadn't noticed so much in previous years, it shows you how rapidly all of this is propagating in the area is this really rapid expansion of solar farms. Um, now I know um, Sarah McCormick spoke to us a few weeks ago uh, about solar energy. Um, and this solar energy here in Almeria is on a really, really large scale. There's no scale in this photo, but maybe in the foreground, you can see there's some scrub vegetation. These are mainly um, almond trees and some olive trees in the background. And all of the light colored ground you'll see in the mid ground before you get to the, the mountains or the hills in the background, these are areas that have been freshly cleared in order to install a very large scale infrastructure for solar farming. Now, decarbonization of energy systems is a good thing. Um, however, when it's done in this way and on this scale, 
um, it can lead to unintended or adverse effects such as biodiversity loss. So a lot of this land which has been cleared uh, is wild land. Some of it has been agricultural um, in the past um, and some small olive groves have actually been removed. So it has uh, led to not only loss of biodiversity but loss of agricultural land um, and may lead to soil degradation in that this is uncovered, it's very arid, it can be quite windy, um, and it may eventually lead to you know, long-term degradation and even loss um, of the delicate soil horizons here. Obviously, it's a very low rainfall area, so the increase in the spatial extent of the desert um, is very real. You can see how dry the ground is in the foreground, and this is springtime, when temperatures are only in high 20s to low 30s. Um, but there may be other impacts um, of doing these kind of installations on this scale in this way in this area that we just can't gather and we don't understand and would find very difficult to predict. So this is what I mean by system thinking. Um, I don't want to be all doom and gloom here. Um, I'd like to um, suggest that there are some alternatives and there may be opportunities to do things in a different way, which hopefully is more sustainable. The photograph on the right um, is not from southeast of Spain, and um, it's from a different area entirely, but it does nicely illustrate a concept of um, agrivoltaics, or sometimes referred to as biosolar. So rather than focus on either 100% agriculture or 100% solar energy, it may be possible to design things in a way that the land can do both. And actually, um, for areas such as the southeast of Spain, um, where it's very intense heat and very low rainfall, the addition of these solar panels can actually provide some shade, which may make it easier to grow certain crops or that they may not need uh, so much water. So that's one example. Um, it, it doesn't sound like rocket science. In fact, it's not. But it's actually quite a rare thing to put these two together. This is something which is also relevant um, in Ireland, not just in areas such as uh, Spain, but as we see proliferation of large scale uh, solar energy generation, um, an unintended consequence of this could be use of good agricultural land. So maybe in this particular way, it's a way to combine both. Uh, I haven't mentioned uh, desalination. I have mentioned low rainfall and use of water um, in this area of Spain. Um, desalination of seawater is uh, very big here um, and other areas. However, it is very energy intensive and a lot of the time this energy is coming from uh, fossil fuel derived. So it's very energy intensive, it has a large carbon footprint and the desalination and production of water does not keep up with demand. Um, and also there are brines which are um, very salty fluids which are then pumped back out to sea, which are not good uh, for the marine environment. So highlighted an opportunity here, rather than uh, use conventional processes for desalination, that solar desalination may be possible. And this may help to decarbonize desalination processes. And it may be possible to do something with the brines, such as recover lithium, or perhaps rare earth element from the brines. Uh, which can then be a new supply for things like energy critical elements for uh, batteries and electronics. But I'm sure there are other um, opportunities here as well. So um, looking at the bigger picture, um, there's a plot on the right, uh, which is taken from a European Environmental Agency report from a few years ago. Probably for many of you, you're familiar with this, but it's, it's highlighting the magnitude and the scale of this challenge. And this instance is Europe's historic greenhouse gas emissions. So the vertical axis is showing the um, megatons of equivalent CO2 through time. So this plot starts from 1990 um, and extrapolates into the future to 2050. The solid black line are the periods of measurement. Um, and between about 1990 and in this case 2018, there was a net decrease of equivalent carbon of around 22%. Now, we hear a lot about net zero. Uh, 2030 and 2050. And if you follow the same trajectory or same slope of that line to the right into the future, you'll see that we really are not on a trajectory to meet climate neutrality by 2030 or 2050. So sometimes the gap between that trajectory and where we want to be um, 
is known as the innovation challenge. And I think this is where systems innovation could really come in, in that it's thinking of the bigger picture and thinking of these complex interactions and interdependencies and allowing us to make predictions and iterative predictions and models about how we think our interventions may actually change things into the future. And nothing is certain. Um, since 2017, um, Trinity College have been partners with an organization called Climate Kick. This is part of the EIT family. EIT is the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, and the KICs, the KIC, are knowledge innovation communities. So Climate Kick, obviously, it's focused on climate. Uh, Trinity has been a partner with Climate Kick since 2017 and involved in a lot of European scale uh, projects, particularly in education, innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and actually, I just returned from um, two days of meetings in Brussels with Climate Kick um, and recently I've joined the governing board um, of the organization. I have to say it's very interesting working with them um, and they're doing a lot of interesting work at scale in Europe um, and beyond. So Climate Kick are Europe's main uh, climate innovation initiative, uh, currently funded through um, the EU as well as privately funded through memberships and from uh, industry. Something local to Ireland, um, Climate Kick run these projects known as deep demonstration or deep demo projects. There is one which is currently running in Ireland, which is part funded through DAFAM, that's the Department of Food, Agriculture and the Marine. And this so-called deep demo project is focused on land use and agri-food systems. So we know that um, land use agri-food systems are responsible for the vast majority of emissions within Ireland. So roughly 38% of equivalent greenhouse gas emissions are coming from land use related to agri-food systems. Um, so this project really is seeking to develop a portfolio approach rather than a single step intervention, but look at a whole load of interventions and how these may be connected, and interconnected, um, and how these can work together to help to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time being mindful of, you know, traditions in agriculture and livelihoods, the whole concept of just transition. Um, and this is a really complex thing to do. Now, Climate Kick have quite a track record in dealing um, in these large scale systems innovation projects uh, across the EU and have had a lot of success to date. And it's a very um, novel way of working at scale in terms of systems innovation um, at scale. So it'll be interesting to see how things progress uh, with this in the coming years. Now, taking a step uh, from my research and moving more into the teaching side, although I will say that there's always an aspect of research in this. Um, I'm working on a project at the moment, which is funded through the Higher Education Authority as part of HCI, this is Human Capital Initiative. It's pillar three, for those of you who know something about it, and pillar three is around innovation and agility in higher and further education. So this is a project led by MTU, Munster Technological University, and um, together with Trinity College and University College Dublin, uh, roughly about 20 or so industry partners, um, and it's called IKC3. And IKC3 is short for Ireland's Knowledge Centre for carbon, climate, and community action. So we have a number of different uh, learning interventions. Some of these are more like CPD, continuing professional development. And um, the tourist program in the middle, tourist you may know is the Irish word for journey. So it's a learning journey. This kicks off next week actually. Um, so keep a look out for evening webinars. There'll be one per month between this month, April um, and October. And these will be in a variety of themes um, and they'll be free to attend once per one per month in the evenings, roughly one hour long. Um, and we're also looking at these things called deep learning demonstrations, which are really local scale place based interventions, looking at local challenges um, and working with communities to develop um, knowledge transfer and learning interventions to help them reach their particular goal. So IKC3, it's one to watch for. Um, you can go to the website, ikc3.ie. You can sign up to the newsletter and be kept up to date of any um, opportunities for courses or for modules, et cetera. Something else John mentioned at the start, um, I think is climate entrepreneurship. 
So I've been very fortunate to partner with Tangent here in Trinity. Uh, and Tangent is Trinity's ideas workspace. This is a separate um, program of work funded by the Higher Education Authority, this time through Springboard Plus. Um, and it's we've just finished the second iteration of running this postgraduate certificate in climate entrepreneurship, and we'll soon be starting uh, the student recruitment for a September intake. So if what I've been discussing is of interest to you, uh, regardless of your level of expertise um, or your background, um, I'd encourage you to have a look at the Tangent website, download the brochure, and keep an eye out on the Springboard uh, website and the Tangent website for uh, the course opening soon. So I'm going to summarize um, really uh, systems innovation and how it relates to sustainability and climate action. I think one thing for certain, we can say that systems are very complex. They're very complex things to understand, to work with, to model, to predict. Um, historically, we can see that linear thinking can and often does lead to unintended negative consequences. I think this could be applied to any sector or any system. Um, and what I'm really keen to do is to have this adoption of a system thinking mindset much more widespread than it currently is, because I think that systems thinking and systems innovation can really enhance our efforts and help bridge this innovation gap and um, between where we are and where we want to be in terms of sustainability and decarbonizing systems. Now, I know I'm biased because I am a geologist and my background is geoscience. I do think that geoscience, geoscientists in particular, um, are very adept at working with systems because of an inherent knowledge of earth systems and how they operate, especially through time. Um, but I would say that not that many geoscientists use their earth system science applied to contemporary environments. So there's still, still a gap there. Um, I do think that mapping geoscience systems onto the sustainable development goals is really important, even crucial, particularly when thinking about energy transitions, land use transitions, um, and any unintended consequences of, for instance, elect electrification of vehicles and over extraction or over exploitation of um, raw materials, for instance. Something I'm really keen on, as you might have gathered from this talk, is the whole multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary nature of research and also teaching. And I highlight here SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals. Um, and finally, as I've just mentioned in the case of the Climate Entrepreneurship um, Postgraduate Certificate and Tangent and School of Natural Sciences, and also the uh, Tourist Learning Program and other IKC3 programs. And I know many, many others, I'm sure John and other speakers have highlighted these many times, there are some really great opportunities available to gain new knowledge and new skills within these areas in sustainability and climate action. So I'm going to wrap it up there uh, and I'm going to open it to you for uh, questions and discussion. Um, as, as Quentin highlighted, a range of courses that um, he, he is responsible and leads in great initiatives, um, both collaboratively with other institutes and within Trinity and True Tangent. Um, and his research, obviously, uh, it's very important. And if you visit the Trinity website through courses and research or engage uh, through the de Department of Geology, you'll find Quentin in, in many ways, many different routes to Quentin through Trinity's website. So thank you very much. Um, next week um, is um, Professor, excuse me, my, my computer is acting up, uh, Professor Sam Cromie from the School of Psychology and his talk will be around sustainable green organizations and how they transition. So looking at the people within the organization that then have perhaps the systems thinking uh, skills and, and how, how that um, will play a role in, in transitioning into a sustainable green organization. So uh, same time next week, I hope you can all join us once again. Thanks as always, we'll share a recording of uh, to those who have registered. So even if you can't make it register, make sure you can get access to, um, to the recordings and you can sign up and uh, please do share um, via social media. Thank you very much. Once again, everyone, have a great lunch. Uh, I hope you've had a great lunch sitting in with us. Um, we greatly appreciate you joining us and see you next time. See you next Wednesday uh, lunchtime. Thanks, Quentin, and have a great day.